Well, first and foremost, Dhul Qarnain, we have very little information about. You know, as you mentioned, was he a time traveler? <laughs> you, know, you, um, you know, whatever thoughts that we have today, uh, realities is we don't know. Um, he pops up in Surah Al-Kahf because the Meccan uh, pagans had uh, had wanted to put some questions or put to challenge Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu whilst he was still in Mecca. So they went to Medina and they met up with the the rabbis there, you know, who had more knowledge about um, Christian theology, Jewish theology, whatever. And um, they gave him or gave them three questions to ask the Prophet Sallallahu which should, according to them, expose him if he was not for real. So the one of the three questions was, who was the Qarnain? And this is what comes up in verse 83 of uh, Surah Al-Kahf that we're supposed to read every Friday, if we're able. There, Allah says in verse 83, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ who, They ask you about ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ Who is the they? The they are the pagan Meccans. Tell them, Allah says, I will recite to you something of his story. So, uh, he, the Prophet Sallallahu then went in to uh, explain what the law revealed through revelation, you know, of the story of Dhul Qarnayn. But who was he uh, in the past and also in the present? Um, Yusuf Ali, he presented in his translation of the Quran, you know, a, an extensive argument for Dhul Qarnayn being Alexander the Great. And yes, there are similarities connected, you know, and he connects all the points and that. But in the end, the bottom line is that Dhul Qarnayn was a righteous believer, a leader, a conqueror, a traveler, but First and foremost, he was righteous. And we see that through all the different steps that he took with the various people that he came across, how he dealt with them, etc. He was a righteous ruler or conqueror or whatever title you want to give him. You know, Alexander the Great was a pagan. He was, you know, a, a Greek, you know, pagan warrior who worshipped idols. So there's no matter what evidence you bring, it contradicts the description which the Quran gives of Dhul Qarnayn. So there's no way that Alexander the Great could be considered to be uh, Dhul Qarnayn. I, I want to get to a very technical question. Um, how did Zulkarnain come across or meet the Yajuj or Majuj? Okay, before going into that, I would just add that the name Zulkarnain, you know, what did it mean? What did it come from? A Qarn normally is a horn. You know, the, the horns on the heads of the animals is called Qarn, same thing. But Qarn also linguistically refers to the top of the head, the very top, highest point on your head. That's also called the Qarn, Qarn al-Ras. And Ali ibn Abi Talib, you know, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu he narrated authentically that Dhul Qarnayn was given this name because 
he was, as he was engaged in spreading the message of Islam in the regions that he went to, he was struck on the top of his head and killed. Actually, he died. Then Allah brought him back to life and he continued to spread Allah's word until he was struck again a second time and he died and that was it. There was no coming back. So this is where the title, the name came from that he had. He was, was hit on his head, killed by being struck on his head twice. Uh, yes, I was asking, uh, how did Zulkarnain come across or come to meet the Yajuj or Majuj? Okay, well, on, on, on his journey, he came across people who complained to him about Yajuj and Majuj having, you know, harmed them uh, attacked them, etc. They suffered from them. So they asked Dhulqarnain to help them to build a wall which would block them from harming those people. We don't know who those people are. You know, we just know that they made this request and Dhulqarnain uh, accepted their request. Uh, they offered to pay him. He didn't want any money for it. This was what power that Allah had given him in terms of construction, etc. And he constructed a wall which would keep them at bay. We don't really know exactly what he did, you know, beyond saying that he, he built a wall. How that wall was, how thick it was, how high it was, you know, uh, where it was, we don't know. We don't have that knowledge. So, uh, you know, those who uh, speculate as to how there could be a wall holding back Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and we didn't actually go into who they are, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, enough to say that how it could be somewhere on the earth you know we've got satellites now you know mapping out the whole earth you know they've covered virtually everywhere virtually but not everywhere but they've covered much of the earth in their mapping so where are these people where is the wall allah knows best we're not going to get into uh, you know, some people are saying, uh, one of our brothers said recently that actually Yajuj and Majuj are zombies. I don't know, we, don't, we don't need to go there, you know. We don't need to go there. I mean, uh, zombies aren't real. It's nonsense anyway. The reality is that, of you know, we can only base our understandings and our discussions around what the Prophet ﷺ has informed us directly uh, himself through the authentic hadiths or uh, his companions uh, narrating from him or explaining, uh, th giving their additional explanations, you know, uh, because that would have been drawn from what they understood from him, you know, or from the Quranic verses themselves. That, that's where we are limited. What are the origins of the Yajuja Majuj according to the Quran and uh, say Hadith? We don't know. We know that there are people, you know, in, in uh, the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians, uh, they, it's confused. You know, are there people or, or is it a person? You know, it's it's uh, it's unclear. Uh, in in the old uh, testament, in Ezekiel, the Old Testament, Gog is an individual, 
and Magog is his land. So the text which refers to Gog and Magog is really Gog from Magog. That's how it was used. But you know, later on in uh, Jewish uh, tafsir, uh, it, it shifted from Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. And that's how it went into Christian writings in the revelations of John and, and de describing uh, the ending of times, you know, um, among the signs of the ending of the world. So that's, uh, that's where it is in, in their scriptures. For us, in terms of who they are, well, the Prophet ﷺ described them as, as being short in stature and having faces like flat shields, flat faces, instead of protruding with noses protruding out and other portions of the face, you know, rounded or pointed, it was flat, okay? And the people who have those kinds of features, you know, are uh, what they call the mongoloid uh, regions, the, 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 the mongoloid people, the people of China and Mongolia and related countries. And as a result of that, uh, some uh, Muslim scholars uh, speculated that Yajuj and Majuj were really Genghis Khan and his hordes that in the 13th century, you know, poured out of Mongolia and China and devastated the world. You know, they massacred, genocide, streets flowing with blood. The, the, modern estimates go from 4 million people being killed, you know, in the various cities that they hit to as much as 40 million. You know, it was a, a massive uh, scene of destruction for, for years. So they concluded that it was the Mongols, Genghis Khan and Hulagu Khan and the others. But reality is that we don't believe that. That, that contradicts, though at the time the people, you know, might have said, well, who else could it be but them? You know, they're seeing it up front. These flat-faced people were coming and killing them, slaughtering them, burning their cities and everything else. You know, it seemed to make sense. But the point is that Rasulullah did describe the times when the yeah, Juj and Majuj would show up. The Gog and the Magog are coming after Dajjal. Has Dajjal come yet? No. So we know that whoever came at different points in time and did different things of the past, that it was not the Gog and the Magog. The Gog and the Magog come after the killing of Dajjal. Prophet Jesus, the Messiah, will kill the false Messiah, Messiah Dajjal. After killing him and resetting the situation, you know, he will be informed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the coming of the Gog and the Magog. So if we haven't seen the signs that were coming before them, then know that it hasn't happened. The Prophet ﷺ had explained that uh, when the uh, Dajjal dominates the world, and again, Dajjal is also a figure of speculation. Some people think Dajjal is, you know, the television because he's described as being one-eyed. Well, actually, it's not one-eyed. People use that. He's, he's blind in one eye, right? So he has one functioning eye. 
So they say that's the television, you know, television screen is like one big eye looking at you. So that's, that's where they go. But this is not the Jal. The Jal is a person. Prophet ﷺ describes him in physical terms and even said that he looks like so-and-so a person from such and such a tribe. This is a man, a human being. Anyway, the point is that after Dajjal is defeated by Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam, and his followers are settling down to take uh, control over the areas that they were in, Prophet Jesus will be informed that the Gog and the Magog are on the way. And he will be told that there is no way of defeating them. They can't be defeated. So along with this, Prophet Muhammad described what's going on in the region where the Gog and the Magog exist. That, that wall which had been built by Dhul Qarnayn, which they would try time and time again to break, to break a hole through. They would reach a point where they would get some light from the other side, but when they would come back the next day to continue their work, it would be closed again. So this was just a continual effort that they made and they were not able to finish the job. So time is going to come. And that is the time when Prophet Jesus has killed the job. At that time, the whole will be the opening for the demolition of the wall. And once they demolish the wall, then they will attack the earth in hordes, like wave after wave. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ described that they would pass by rivers and, and streams and lakes and just take all the, the, the water from all of the places that they pass by, they will just use up all of the water. What was described is that they would fight. Of course, people of the earth will try to uh, withstand them, to, to block them, to stop them. And they will just be defeating you know, armies and peoples left and right. And uh, they will reach a point where they have beaten everybody. Nobody else left on earth to, to meet them, to fight against them. And then they will turn to the sky and turn their weapons towards the sky. And they will fire into the sky what are described as arrows and lances. Of course, Alano's best you know, um, what instruments they will use at that time, but they will be like arrows and lances. And these weapons will fall back to earth covered in blood. And they will say that they've killed the beings of the sky. And some will even say, we killed God. God is dead, we've killed him. You know? So it is up to that point that they will reach, having defeated the world, the world is submitted to them, and they are now turning to what is beyond the world, claiming to even kill what is beyond the world. Nothing can stop them. At this point, of course, uh, Prophet ﷺ told us that Prophet Jesus uh, would take refuge with his followers, those who were 
uh, with him in the fight against the Jal, etc., stayed with him, that they would take refuge in uh, Mount Tur. And they would hide out there. And when the Gog and the Magog reached that pinnacle of power, Allah will send some worm-like creatures that would bore its way into their heads from the back, from their neck, the back, going boring into their brains, and it would just wipe them out like a plague, it just hits them, and they die to the last man. That's how they will be defeated by Allah's command. Human beings were incapable, uh, or other human tribes, nations, etc., were incapable of stopping them. Okay, I don't want to overlap the timelines, um, but this is a very important question. Uh, will there be a role of Hazrat Isa, may peace be upon him, or Imam Mahdi uh, in defeating the Yajuj or Majuj? Imam Mahdi is way before. I mean, is before the time of Prophet Isa. It, I mean, he was a, he already appeared uh, before the time of Prophet Isa, and his struggle with the the armies of the north, east, and west uh, culminates with the time of the return of Prophet Isa. Right, Dajjal is involved in the struggle with Imam Mahdi. So he's from an the early period of these uh, various events. Uh, but in terms of Prophet Jesus, after the defeat of the Gog and the Magog, then he will rule the earth for a period of time. He will marry, have children, make Hajj, and as ruler of the earth, he will die. He will die on the earth, you know, as all other human beings have done. And at that point when he dies, then Allah will send a wind. And that wind will pass, you know, around the bodies of the, the believers, in the swarming, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, described it as passing under their armpits. So, you know, the, the wind will blow this way and blow that way. And as it passes around and over the bodies of the believers, it will take their souls. So all of the true believers will die at that time. And those remaining, living on the earth will be disbelievers. And it is at that point when the angel who is to blow the trumpet or horn for signaling the end of the world, following that process, then the trumpet or horn will be blown. And the processes now that Allah describes in the Quran of the, you know, the seas boiling over and 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 all the various, you know, sun rising in the west and all these other things will be happening now. The final uh, signs of the last hour, major signs, will end off the world, which is described in the Quran. At what point does Dabatul Ard appear? Allah knows best. I can't uh, speak on that uh, because the information on Dabatul Ard is the least. It's among, but what it is is that this creature will come uh, from the, you could say, the belly of the earth, will come out and speak to the people. You know, this is among the final calls for people to accept Allah before the ending of the world. But 
at what point exactly does it fit in? Is it while the Ya'juj and Ma'juj are, are happening, or is it in the time of the Dajjal, when the Dajjal is strong and, and conquering, and he will pop up, or the Dabat al Ard will pop up at that point? Allah knows best. Uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips, it was such a pleasure having you on the show. Would you want to give any last message to our viewers and audience? My pleasure to be here. But let me just add a, a point or two. That, you know, when Allah has told us about all of this, uh, He has told us about it through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, for us to take lessons from, so it's not just, you know, a history lesson for the future. It's it's a it's it contains lessons for the present, and that's what we need to take out of it. Whether we're dealing with Dhul Qarnain and how Dhul Qarnain dealt with the people that he came across, you know, uh, judging righteously. Uh, providing help, building the wall, you know, this is also calling us to being helpful to those around the world that are in need of help, whether they're people who are, as mentioned in the Quran, you know, who didn't have any clothes, they didn't have any means of covering themselves, you know, he provided the means, he supported them. So, uh, this also calls us to follow the, the way of Dhul Qarnain in terms of helping others, not utilizing one's strength and power, etc., to dominate and subjugate others. You know? So uh, from that and from also the, the story concerning the Gog and the Magog, uh, that those forces of evil won't give up. They will keep going until they finally are destroyed. Don't think that we're going to find paradise on this in this world. You know, the struggles that we will have to go through, this is the nature of this world. And Prophet Jesus, you know, in spite of who he was and who he is, and who he will be with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even he would reach a point where he could not do anything more. Allah is the one. He is Al-Aziz. He is Al-Qawi. He is, you know, all of the attributes necessary to provide protection for human society and to help us out of these various situations. So we should turn to him. Instead of turning to others in this life, you know, um, whether they're dead or living, seeking help from them, when they're not in a position to really help us, you know, we need to uh, direct our prayers as Prophet Jesus did after he and his followers, the forces that were with him, realized that they could not stop the Gog and the Magog. The Gog and the Magog were overpowering the whole earth. But Allah stopped it when the time was right. Oh, he could have stopped it from the very beginning. So among the lessons that we should also learn from this circumstance, you know, uh, there is a narration from Zainab bint Jash, in which uh, she related that the Prophet Sallallahu had said on one occasion, uh, describing situation, this situation related to the Gog and the Magog, he said, woe to the Arabs from the great evil that has approached them. Today, a hole has been opened in the dam, in the 
wall of the Gog and the Magog. A hole like this. And Zainab asked him, O Messenger of Allah, shall we be destroyed even though there are righteous people among us? And he replied saying, yes, if evil deeds become plentiful, if evil deeds become plentiful, then Allah's destruction can come on people, not just on the evil amongst them, but on all of the people. The good who are in their midst will be destroyed at the same time. If they do not engage in commanding the good and forbidding the evil, if they remain silent, because why is that destruction coming? Because the good were silent. And silence in the presence of evil is like support of evil. 